Hello and welcome to this video uh, where we're going to continue um, our confidence interval um, uh, skill sets and practice um, doing confidence intervals on the difference of means. Not just the confidence interval on a mean, but the difference of means. So let's go ahead and set this up. If we have two populations, two populations with means, we'll say mu1 and mu2, populations 1 and 2, and variances, variances sigma1 squared and sigma2 squared. We want to compare their population means and get estimates on the difference. <clears throat> we want to compare their population means. Means, population averages, and get estimates on mu1 minus mu2, the difference. All right, so what are we going to do here? Well, some things to think about, right? Um, we're going to have to draw independent samples from the population. We'll draw independent samples. We'll say N1 from population 1 and N2 from population 2. Remember the sample means are x1 bar and x2 bar. The sample variances then would be s1 squared and s2 squared and we can compute all four of these statistics both sample means and both sample variances if we want to right um notice that x1 bar minus x2 bar is an unbiased estimator of the difference in populations because the linearity of the expectation here tells us that we can look at the expected value of x1 bar minus the expected value of x2 bar and the expected value of x1 bar we know to be mu1 and the expected value of x2 bar we know to be mu2 okay and what would be the uh, variance what would be the variance of the difference of x1 bar minus x2 bar well um, thinking back what we know about the variance of a combination of random variables um, this is going to be the variance of x1 bar minus x2 bar and so this is going to be 1 squared times the variance of x1 bar plus negative 1 squared times the variance of x2 bar and what is the variance of x1 bar well x1 bar follows a normal distribution with a variance of sigma squared 1, not just sigma squared, but remember this is the variance of x1 bar, the variance of the sample mean over n. And then same thing for the variance of x2 bar, just with the appropriate subscripts, sigma2 squared over n2. Remember the uh, central limit theorem says that the variance of the sample mean is sigma squared over n. And this would be n1 down there as well. All right. So a lot of this is just kind of setting up um, what we're doing. Uh, what we're really going to focus on just um, for, for this video and, and for, for the remainder of this semester um, due to some time constraints is we're actually going to deal with um, differences in means where we might assume we'll know the population variances. Um, we know that we can adjust if we have to work with the sample variances and 
previous videos, we discussed how we can look at things like the t-distribution. Um, we could talk about how that affects the difference of sample means. It's a little bit more complicated, um, but we're just going to um, simplify things a little bit to make our lives a little bit easier for now. So recall from theorem 8.3, what we have here, if our sample sizes are both larger than 30, both large enough, then x1 bar minus x2 bar minus the proposed population means or the supposed population means divided by the standard deviation of the difference here, which would be the square root of the variance, the square root of sigma 1 squared over n1 plus sigma 2 squared over n2 is approximately standard normal. We can call that a z, random variable z, that it's approximately standard normal. And as n gets larger, this converges to the standard normal distribution. In relation to confidence intervals then, well, there we go, right? The probability, if we take, uh, let's take an area of alpha split on the left and right evenly, split on the left and right evenly, so that would be negative z of alpha over 2. And on the right, we would have positive z of alpha over 2. Right, Being between these values would give us a probability of 1 minus alpha. And so we would have our z value right in between then. Right? x1 bar minus x2 bar minus mu1 minus mu2 all over the standard deviation, the square root of sigma1 squared over n1 plus sigma2 squared over n2. All this is doing is setting up how we can compute the confidence interval now for, for mu1 minus mu2 by solving this compound inequality here inside of our probability statement for mu1 minus mu2. So we can do things like multiply by the standard deviation all the way through, you know, subtract x1 bar minus x2 bar, and then multiply by negative 1. And once we do that, we'll get a 100, 1 minus alpha, we'll get our confidence interval for mu1 minus mu2, a 100 times 1 minus alpha percent confidence interval for mu1 minus mu2 is given by, given by, let's see if we can write this out here. And in order to make this a little bit um, maybe easier to digest, I'll write it as follows. Since the left and right are symmetric, 1 is plus, 1 is minus. Okay. Um, what are we going to have here? Our confidence interval, our, our limits are given by x1. Well, let's write it this way first. x1 bar minus x2 bar minus z of alpha over 2 times the square root of sigma 1 squared over n1 plus sigma 2 squared over n2. There's your lower bound for mu1 minus mu2. Your upper bound then was the same thing. Your upper bound is the same thing, just plus. x1 bar minus x2 bar plus z of alpha over 2 times the square root of sigma 1 squared over n1 plus sigma 2 squared over n2. All right. So this gets a little bit, um, again, uh, messy and, and lengthy in terms of the general notation. Um, I will often think of it this way. Um, I would say maybe, or equivalently, we can find the limits Equivalently, quiv the confidence limits are, and I tend to think maybe you're writing it this way, since everything is the same, I just have both plus and minus cases. So it's x1 minus x2 bar plus or minus z of alpha over 2 times the square root of sigma 1 squared over n1 plus sigma 2 squared over n2. These are our confidence limits. This is not the interval. These are the limits. Then I can use those as our endpoints, right? And this is just more condensed. It's a little bit easier to maybe look at than 
the actual interval given in the above box. All right, we need to try to do just one example here um, before we finish up this video. And I think you'll find that once you put some actual numbers to this, right, um, this isn't maybe as hairy as it looks. So let's go ahead and start to set this up. So here's our example. Let's make the text a little bit bigger here so we can read this in our notes. That looks good. Give my box some space. Example. Two types of engines. All right, we compared two engines A and B. 50 experiments were completed on A. Fifty experiments were completed on A, and seventy-five were completed on B. The average gas mileage for A was thirty-six mpgs and forty-two miles per gallon. 42 miles per gallon for B. Let's assume the population standard deviations are 6 and 8. Let's go ahead and try to find a 96% confidence interval. For, let's do a 96% confidence interval for mu sub b minus mu sub a, the difference from b and a. Because it looks like it looks like you 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 might surmise here. We're not we're not doing hypothesis testing, but you you might hypothesize that since the average gas mileage for b 42 is significantly larger than the average gas mileage for a you would maybe expect that um, you you would sort of maybe expect that the average gas mileage for B is in fact greater than a right you might suspect that this is the case right if this is true then mu B minus mu a should be bigger than zero right if if the average for B is bigger than a you'd expect that to be zero so this is sort of a little bit of um, uh, foreshadowing on, on why we end up caring about confidence intervals for um, uh, difference of means is because you can ask questions like this in the future and say, well, I think B is better than A, right? And can you provide some sort of statistical proof that that is the case? Let's go ahead and just find this 96% confidence interval. All right. What do we need here? In order to find the 96% confidence interval, we're going to need to know what the point estimate is for the difference. And we can use the sample means to do that. So the sample mean for B was 42 miles per gallon, and the sample for A was 36, and so this difference is just 6. Looks good. Uh, what do we have for, um, uh, what do we have now? We need Z of alpha over 2. What would be, so Z of alpha over 2, this is a 96% confidence interval, so alpha is 4%. So half of that would be, 2%. So what is Z of 0.02? What is Z of 0.02? That would leave an area of 2% to the right. 2% to the right. So we need to go into our normal table and take a look. Let's see, where's my normal table here? Uh, let's search this up. Um, I've got it in my reader here. Here's my statistical table. Where's the normal table? You do 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 do. Areas under the normal curve. I need 2% to the right, 2% to the right, or 98% to the left. And where is 0 0.980? 0 0.980 is right about here. Pretty close to that area. That's about 2.0. Um, pretty darn close. Pretty darn close to 2.05, right? 
right? 0.978, and I was looking for 0.98. That's very close, right? That's very close to 2.05. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and take 2.05. There's no need to do any sort of averaging, like 2.055 or anything like that, because it's not right in the middle of these numbers, per se. Um, well, it is pretty close to the middle, um, but I would, I would uh, surmise that uh, it's not going to make much of a difference here, and we'll take 2.05. Two point oh five. If you do two point oh five five, you should get a similar interval as well. Let's see what happens now. What do we need? We need sigma one squared. So what do we need? We need sigma a squared. Uh, the standard deviation is six for a, so that would be thirty six as the variance. Sigma squared b would be sixty four since the standard deviation was eight. Right? Square the standard deviation to get the variance. And what are these sample sizes? N, the sample size for A was 50 experiments. The sample size for B is 75. 75, there we go. So, what is our, uh, what are our interval um, uh, bounds? Well, X1 bar minus X2 bar, looking at the above, that is just 6 here. So this is going to be 6 plus or minus 2.05 times the square root of... Sigma 1 squared over N1. So this is, what is sigma 1 squared? Careful here. This is XB minus XA. So this should be, this should be what here? Well, actually, you know what? <laughs> because this is addition, because this is addition here, the ordering actually doesn't matter. The ordering does not matter. But if I want to be consistent with my notation here, XB is listed first on that. So I have 64 over 75 plus 36 over 50. Those are my interval bounds. Those are my interval bounds. And so we run that through a calculator. When I do the minus, I should get about 3.43 if I chop that off. And if we do the plus, if we do the plus, we should get about 8.5. And that is our 96% confidence interval for the difference there. That's our 96% confidence interval. Again, getting ahead of myself here a little bit, notice that zero is not in this interval. Um, and so it is uh, pretty, um, pretty reasonable to say that B has a higher gas mileage than A um, on average. Um, in fact, probably, it's probably at least 3.4 miles per gallon better, um, maybe up to 8.5 miles per gallon better, okay? Uh, but again, once you put some actual numbers to it, right, uh, I don't think uh, this is too bad. This isn't too bad, all right? Um, and that's really all there is uh, about to this um, for now, so we're going to go ahead and end this video here, and we will see you in the next video.